It is extremely important that a programming language designer have a method for describing programming languages in a very formal way. This is what compiler and interpreter writers will use to determine what the elements of the language are, what requirements there are for identifiers, reserved words, strings, numeric literals, and so on. It is just as important that they know exactly what the syntax of the language is and what is the meaning of particular syntactic structures. Without this, it becomes very difficult to create a translation of the program that accurately performs the tasks that the programmer expressed in the original source code. These three terms represent the three sets of issues that a programming language's creator and the compiler writer will have to deal with. Lexics refers to issues regarding the assembly of words that comprise a statement. And in truth, we don't mean just words. We need to be able to make sense of the stream of characters and put them together in a way that makes sense. Taking a stream of input and grouping them arbitrarily into groups of five characters doesn't help us. Imagine for a moment that we are reading int main void at the beginning of a C program. It's clear that this first grouping is int, the second one main, then there is an open parenthesis by itself, the word void, and a closed parenthesis by itself. This is meaningful, while the arbitrary grouping into groups of five would not help in the least. Syntax refers to issues regarding the grammar of a language. Every language has its own grammar, and programming languages are not exceptions to this rule. This gives us a way to make sense of the grouping of words, and it will provide us with a way to get the meaning of what is written. Semantics refers to issues regarding the meaning of a statement. Syntax is about how we arrange words. Semantics is about the meaning of these groups of words. Making sense of the semantics can be much more difficult than lexical and syntactic issues, as we will see. In the early days of programming language development, specifying the syntax of a language was considered enough. We know now that this is not the case. We need to know how its words are put together, as well as the meaning of the grammatical constructs in our programs. It became apparent that a formal way of specifying a grammar was necessary. Noam Chomsky and John Backus worked on this independent of each other. Chomsky recognized that there is a hierarchy of four different types of languages. Backus came up with a formal notation for specifying syntax. Peter Narr made small changes in it, and we still use this notation. It's called Backus Narr form, or for short, BNF. Syntax is the arrangement of words as elements in a sentence to show their relationship. Syntax is important. It tells us the role that each word plays in a sentence. Let's look at the sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dogs. We have a subject, a verb phrase, and an object. Because we are familiar with English language grammar, we know that the fox is performing the action, that the action is jumping, and the dogs are the ones being jumped over. In the example on this slide, we know that we must perform multiplication before we perform the addition, and we need to encode it in our syntax. Semantics is all about what the symbols mean. It is as important as the syntax in guaranteeing that we translate the program correctly and unambiguously in making sense of language ambiguity is never a good thing. As we make sense of the character strings that we assemble from a steady stream of characters, what we produce is a string called a lexeme. This is the actual character string as we put it together. We relate it to something called a token. A token is a representation of the grammatical component that this string represents in the language. Tokens fall into several categories. Reserved words usually but by no means always have a one-to-one -one relationship with the string to which they correspond. So the lexemes if, then, else, for, and while will each have a token that corresponds to that particular lexeme. When we are writing them or speaking of them, we will usually represent them as if, then, else, and so on. We usually represent the tokens as enumerations 
We will see this a little later. Literals typically share a single token called literal because all literals will appear in the same place in the syntax of a language. Yes, they can have different types, but that is a semantic issue, not a syntactic issue. There are also special symbols such as the less than or equal sign or a plus sign. These may have their own token or they may share one with similar symbols that can appear in the same place. Plus and minus may commonly share a token because they can be used in the same place in a statement and they share the same level of precedence in an expression. And lastly, identifiers will usually all share the same token, identifier. Reserved words usually serve a special purpose within a language's syntax. They can indicate that you have a particular type of statement, they can indicate a particular data type, or they can serve as a delimiter. This is why you will see begin and end in many languages. Most languages have reserved words, but they may also have standard identifiers. Standard identifiers are identifiers, just like the ones that programmers declare in a program. They serve no special syntactic purpose, which makes them quite different from reserved words. A standard identifier is predefined and may have a predefined value if it is a constant. It might be a predefined data type or a function or a procedure. And another difference is that you can redefine them in many cases. For example, if pi is predefined as 3.14, you might be able to redefine it as 3.14159. Standard identifiers are common in Pascal and Ada. Fixed field languages are generally a holdover from the days of punch cards. That's why Fortran statements are line oriented and the margins that we use are fixed. The same is true for COBOL and RPG, languages that were used for business computing and report generation. This sometimes makes it difficult for programmers to lay out a program in a way that they may want to. And in most cases, there is usually no need for this requirement, except for the fact that this is what the compiler expects to see. Algol and languages derived from it broke out of this mold. Most modern languages are freeform. Lexemes in most languages do not have a fixed length but this can make things a little more difficult. For example, let's say that you have DOIF in a program. Is it one word doi for do if? Or is it two words do if? The easiest way of handling it is what we do in English, which is to require a blank space between words. Fortran breaks many rules, mainly because the rules didn't exist or we didn't know that they existed until well after Fortran came out. Backus knew that IBM key punch operators didn't always space over after getting to the correct starting column on a punch card. For this reason, it was decided that blank spaces would be ignored in Fortran as long as what you punched in was within the allowable margins. The problem is that there was a well-known case where this led to a misreading of the words. That was in the do statement. If you look at the two do statements, you will see that two statements are almost identical, except that one has a comma and the other a period. In both cases, as the compiler begins to translate it, it assumes that do 99i is an identifier and it is being assigned a value. It is only when it encounters the comma that it knows that this is the wrong way to scan it and parse the program. So it backtracks and scans again, knowing that it is looking for the token do, a number, and then an identifier. Armed with this knowledge, it scans and parses again, this time correctly recognizing that this is a do statement. Regular expressions are the most restricted and the simplest of the four types of languages in the Chomsky hierarchy. It gives us three ways of combining regular expressions. Concatenation, where we have two expressions in sequence. Repetition, where we have an expression repeating an indefinite number of times, or however many times we need to repeat it. And selection, where we will use one expression or the other. This is a convenient and a formal way of describing how we can specify words, 
numbers, or some kinds of symbols. We can have a letter followed by either a letter or a digit zero or more times. Or we can have a digit followed by more digits zero or more times. In the first case, we have written the specification for an identifier. In the second case, we have written the specification for an integer value. We can use this to specify any character string that would be legal in a programming language. But there are other things that we can do that will let us be more specific with the character string that we want in our language. A-Z, in square brackets, allows us to specify any lowercase letter, A through Z. R plus lets us specify one or more occurrences of R, which can also be useful and is easier to work with than R followed by zero or more R's. We can also use a question mark to indicate an optional term, something that we can have here, but do not have to have here. And we can use a period to indicate where we can have any one character, regardless of what it is. To those of you familiar with Unix or Linux filters, this should seem fairly familiar. You should have seen this working with grep and sed. But this can also be useful in designing a scanner, the basic first step in writing a compiler.